All right, welcome to another episode of Potting with PT. I'm Patrick. I'm Tyler. And today we're joined by student physical therapist, Akeem Baboye. Smooth, you got it right on the first Oh uh, No, I was like, whew, I was getting a little nervous. <laughs> okay. But, but <laughs> Tayo is um, in, in uh, what, third year PT school? Yeah, third year. Third year. And then also has interest in sports residency. Honestly, he's he's he kind of best networker I know. Like he's always on Twitter, everything. He's like he got connections. He got connections. But I'll let this this young man introduce himself. So let us let us know a little bit about yourself, where you're um where you're at school and just kind of different interests. Yeah, so basically I go to school at Ethica College in New York. It's technically upstate, but it's more like West because basically anything that's above the Bronx is considered upstate in New York. So <laughs> everybody's like, oh, it's upstate. Nice. But like, it's more basically like Western centralish uh, New York. Uh, it gets pretty cold over there, but I go to a six year program. So it's a uh, entry level program from high school. Uh, you'll get your bachelor's in four years and the doctorate in six. Um, what else is there? I mean, I'm from originally from Newburgh, New York. So that's like about three hours from Ithaca. It's closer to New York City, but not in New York City. Again, that upstate differential is crucial. East Coast uh, boy. Yeah, East Coast for real. But uh, born to two Nigerian parents. Uh, both of them came over from uh, Nigeria. My dad came in like the 80s and then my mom came after. Um, I got a brother and a sister. My brother is a nurse and my sister is a PA. So is that how you got started in like the medical field or just how did you get into PT? Oh, no, I had no choice. I had to go to medical field. <laughs> See, my parents, well, my parents, it was a lawyer, doctor, and, you know, you know, Wait, hold on. You cut out along just for a second. Realms. I knew, uh, my bad, I'll repeat. So like, uh, my parents were saying basically like if you're, if you're not like an engineer lawyer or doctor then like it's over like you got to do something along those realms so I knew I kind of wanted to get into medical field or at least like a health profession um it kind of took a little bit longer but once I started to get closer into like that high school range I knew I had to figure something out because they were they're on my ass not gonna lie but uh i started doing some more research started doing more, more research into some of the different fields and uh, i liked athletic training and then i also liked pt so i decided to shadow in pt um i did that my junior year i believe at an outpatient ortho i really liked it so i started looking into uh the six-year programs up here in new york because there's actually a lot of them how you like the six-year program because ours was seven and I felt like that was just a lot of information all at once, for me at least. So I liked it only because I knew I knew I wanted to take less exams. So if you go into a lot of the six-year ones, you don't have to do that GRE. So I was like, bet, because you know, my, my SAT scores already weren't that like super lit. So I was like, I can't be doing GRE, all this stuff. So I want to, I looked at schools that had the six year. So it was like direct entry as long as you hit certain requirements. So less, less extra things that I had to do. And then two, um, I still want to play sports. So I looked at schools that kind of had both of them, but it wasn't, it wasn't bad, honestly. Like if anything, I feel like it was an easier transition because you could see the professors beforehand. So like we didn't necessarily have our PT professors, like, you know, freshmen, sophomore, junior year but you at least got to see them a lot so you could start talking about pt from your first year yeah that's nice but i so at sacred heart they did have like a three plus three program and i i didn't do it but just listening to them having to take extra classes summer classes i feel like very easy to get burnt out uh did you feel that way no, but only because I, I was traveling a lot. So like <laughs> I was still making, so basically the way that, the way that our program works is by your, by your junior year, you take that summer anatomy course. So like our senior year is really like that first year of PT, but we're not, 
we're not trying to cram the three, the three plus three. So you do graduate um, in four years, not three years. So it's still on like a regular track and they make sure that, you know, you hit your certain requirements for the minor course you have to do, the, the general ed requirements that you have. So I didn't feel burned out in that sense. You start to feel more burned out when you get to the PT shit. Cause like, that's when, <laughs> that's when stuff gets real. You learn a neuro, you learn a peds, all that stuff. But we have, we have a break right before we get into that. So that summer, after you graduate that summer, we have off. For me, I, I was dumb. Well, I wasn't dumb, but I decided to uh, be a TA for anatomy. So then that's why I technically didn't have a free summer. Uh, but other than that, we really have that free summer off. Sweet. All right. And then um, let talk to us about how you're just getting into PT school and then starting that transition. And how did you feel uh, kind of starting starting that? Yeah, so with Ethica, it was crazy too, because like most of the other schools I applied to, um, I did them early action. So I was like, all right, bet, like, I think I'll get into them. I got into a couple. I think I got deferred. I was like, damn. <laughs> like, I was kind of, I was like, I was like, I was, like, was kind of awkward because, especially because I was like talking to the football coach there and he had seen my transcripts. So he's like, oh, he should be fine. And it was like, oh, you didn't get in. I'm like, uh, we'll see. Cause I knew, I knew that's really where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So I got in maybe like March, April-ish, like close to like the deadline to choose a school. Uh, and then all the undergrad stuff was pretty cool. Um, I chose Spanish as my minor. So like that was a lot of fun. Uh, ended up switching it into a major just because of how interesting it was to me. And like having the opportunity to study abroad for a little bit was cool too. Um, but then getting into PT school. So like once we hit like senior year, that's when, you know, stuff got serious uh, right. it was it was tough I mean it still is tough we we kind of just got past like the the harder part of a lot of the curriculum but I would say the biggest thing was like having a support system having friends that are going through the same thing I think what's cool about this program is the fact that like we're all starting from our freshman year or our first year so like you know a lot of these people since day literally like day one like all the people I live with I've known pretty much all of them since I first came to this campus so like you already have that bond with these people where you're like okay like we know we can get through this we're going to struggle a little bit but like we could take a few L's here and there as long as like we're all on the same page like we'll, we'll get to the end goal so I think that that's been like the the more unique part about having a six-year program no oh, nice yeah I think it was it's kind of interesting especially how many how many like um out of, I guess, like external students, did you have? Did there were there any at all? No, so they don't. I don't think Ithaca allows any external people except for if you are already at the school and like you try to transfer in. The problem with that is, is that they try their hardest to like not let people transfer in unless like unless you you were balling out, then they're like, all right, like maybe we'll consider it because they already accept OD people to begin with. Like my cohort is like. I think it's like 92 people and that's like after people dropped out so like Damn. first year is probably like 100 something people gosh so now i don't feel as bad for them never getting back to me because i applied to ithaca and they didn't even respond to my email yo they're ruthless i'm not going <laughs> on like but it's not you know what it is though like part of that though isn't it isn't necessarily the pt department i, I believe most of the admission stuff goes through admissions so like they don't really technically see you until you get on the campus. That's why I was kind of tight. Cause I was like, yo, you didn't even, I could have not got in because of the, def uh, when they deferred me mm -hmm. and the, the program would have never even like seen me. It didn't get to them yet. So I think that's like an interesting piece. There's no like interview process for that program. Yeah, I needed that interview process. So that, that doesn't make me feel as bad now. Cause I'm like, <laughs> Ithaca and all the damn, I don't even know if I got in or not. They just didn't respond. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I think it's, that's really interesting because um, at Sacred Heart, we had, I want to say like 20 external students. Yeah. Um, out of what started with like 70? 73, I think is what we started with. The wild thing is, I'll never forget this. So 
one of the girls I sat next to during undergrad graduation because we had like the same, we were close in last name. And uh, we were talking about like, damn, PT school is about to be rough. And then I saw her the first week of, of PT school during orientation, never saw her again. I was like, oh shit, that's what this is about yeah. to be. Yeah. <laughs> she, felt, uh, she, did, she was like, no, nah, I'm not doing this. Mm-hmm. I look they, they talk wild crazy I was like hey look <laughs> I was like don't worry about grades you just need to pass I'm just like <laughs> it's a lot easier said than done you just need to pass I'm like dog I'm trying oh my god yeah no that's a fact because even you know the, the craziest part too is that like say because of the fact that it is like you go four years and then you get into PT stuff imagine going to your senior year and realizing that you don't want to do PT and you did all the you did all the work to get to there, all the prerequisite stuff, but like you hit some year and you're like, damn, like you get to um, MSK one, you're like, I don't really like this shit. So like, <laughs> it, you know, our bachelor's degree isn't, um, it's not like an exercise science degree or something like that. It's it basically, a, in my opinion, it's a degree designed for you to apply to somewhere else if you don't like PT. Like it's not really- I don't think it's like a standalone type of degree. You know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a clinical health studies degree, uh, which I mean, the school could probably explain it better than me, but in my opinion, I'm kind of looking at that, like, what am I going to really do with this if I don't like PT? So it gives you the prerequisites to go, you know, apply to PA school, apply to, you know, other like med related type of fields, OT, stuff like that. But you could go all those years and then you're thinking like, all right, I just got like two more apps to this and then you hit you know msk1 all that stuff and you're like oh wait maybe i don't like this stuff and then you <laughs> you gotta stick it out for you know two semesters of something you're not interested in yeah did you feel prepared like going into the transition uh or going into the actual pt school because you were kind of that was like the prep for the, the whole undergrad i would say mm, yes and no so like but yes, in the sense of the anatomy course that we took like right before it was, that, that was OD. So like but our professor, he, Dr. Yegi, his only like, his sole class is that anatomy course. Like that's all he teaches all year. He knows his stuff so well. Um, and that's kind of like the transition period between like you being undergrad and then like you being like, you know, first year SPT. I felt like that was the first time where I kind of felt smart was like <laughs> finishing that course because it it got you in the habit of how you wanted to study for PT school. So like that type of grind was just something we didn't really have earlier. Like we had tough classes, but like we didn't have that type of difficulty. So then once you hit senior year, you already kind of knew what to expect in terms of like um, all those like beginner PT courses. Like, okay, like now I know how I have to study for this, how I have to study for that. Like even though you're still going to take some L's, but it was like, all right, like at least, at least I know my direction of like where I'm going to go with this stuff. Okay. Yeah. It seems like, like a common trend because we talked about how getting into PT school and just like that first couple of tests, you're just like, wow, I am different. It's it's different. (laughs) And I wonder if that's just like across the board. It's like, there's no way, no, I don't think any way to, really prepare you of what PT school is about to be like and that grind that you have to go through it's a lot I feel like just in general like not even just PT school but grad school I'm like school in general does a terrible job of teaching you how to learn information instead of just how do I regurgitate it on an undergrad test and get a good grade but at the end of the day I never knew what I learned out of bio any of those classes I just knew how to regurgitate the powerpoint so it was like, then you get into any type of grad school, whether it be medical or law or anything like that. And it's like, now you have to, you have to know what you're talking about. So they're not just going to ask you, what is this definition? Whereas like, now I need to take what that definition is, apply it to somebody or a case or a patient. And now do I know everything about that? I was like, I think it just kind of shapes your mind. And that's why I think everyone talks about like, those first couple of tests are rough. Cause it's like, I'm not used to having to know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. So like, I think that's, no, that's a fact. Mean. No, I was going to say, I agree with that, especially like going back to like bio, like my first, my freshman year, I'm like, all right, like this is bio, whatever, I should be all right. My first exam, I got like a 50 on it. I was like, damn. And like, I was already, it was already, it was already a point where my parents were like, 
if you if you don't do well in school and you're trying to play sports, it's a dub, like it's over. And <laughs> I remember getting that grade and I was like, oh, I had to get a tutor. I signed up for a tutor immediately. Yeah. Um, and I started working on that. And actually like I got into tutoring after that because of the person who tutored me there. Uh, shout out to Olivia, because she she was a PT. She was the year ahead of me, but she was in like that PT track. Um, and without her, like, she was like, I guarantee you're going to get 10 points higher on each exam after this. And she was right. It happened. But it was like going through that struggle and realize it kind of like what you said, like, it's a different way to studying, even for me, just different way of studying in college. In general, I had to learn how to like, actually study. And then like you said, get to PT school and be like, all right, like, less memorization, more of like, how do you apply it to a case? How do you apply it to a person? What's the important pieces of this that I'm going to need for the future? That kind of takes a lot of adjusting too, because you're, like you said, you're still kind of in that mode of like, I just got to get this stuff right for like a multiple choice exam. Uh, so you get to that first practical and you're like, oh, you asking those sorts <laughs> of follow-up <laughs> questions? Like, right. Uh, yeah, I think but, lucky for us, as much as I hated this class, we had this class where we had to, every week, you'd have to open up and or so it's two cases a week and pretty much you read down in your small group. So you read a case about a patient and you got to highlight everything that's important. And then when you highlight that, so it's like you break it down to like anatomy, um, what was it patho or like different intervention exam. And then each person, yeah, each person has to take that topic and that's their presentation for that next class. It should would take like three hour, two, three hour classes. And it would be like six hours just research it afterwards. But it's wild because then when we started going to like our clinicals and giving like our case studies and presenting our stuff, you could see the difference where when we had to do all that stuff, how it pays off. And like, it, it was, it made a lot of difference in the way I started treating. So I'm like, all right, he's telling me 50 different things. What is one thing that's really important? Or what are a couple of things that stand out? And I think that's a pretty cool thing that they did for us where it was like, all right, what can you take important from a case what, do you, what don't you know? Go look it up. Then when you come back, now you at least have some information. Right? So I thought it was completely pointless when we were doing it. It was a waste of time, but that really helped me. No, that's pretty dope. And that's kind of, I feel like that's kind of the way that this next clinical I'm about to go to, how they, how they set up things. Like they, they expect me weekly to kind of come up with this like clinical question and find articles to like support why I want to search this and like how it's going to be beneficial to the next patients I work with. So it's not something that I would say we necessarily like learned as much in school, uh, but I do like that type of model because it helps you think for more, like you were saying, just more relevant things and like trying to break it down as much as possible. So is this your, uh, talk to us about those clinicals. So is this your first clinical or this, how many clinicals have you done? I, I've already done one. So we, we used to have four. They switched it up on us now. We got three. I'm still tight about that, but that's a whole nother conversation. Uh, so I just did, I did outpatient ortho this past summer. Um, I'm going into another outpatient ortho. Uh, this one, and then my third one's going to be uh, in sports. So oh, yeah. you're probably thinking like, how the hell, how are you not doing no inpatient, something like yeah. that. So <laughs> I had to do the acute care. I was sick. Yeah. So like because of COVID, um, we were able to basically like bypass that just because a lot of places weren't taking students. Um, but we had to make it up by taking an acute care course. So I'll be doing that virtually, like asynchronously on this um, second rotation that I'm doing. Uh, and then basically I do this one for 10 weeks. I go back to school for a block. I graduate and then I go on a final clinical. So my DPT isn't necessarily official till August. Oh, that's wild. If I had, once we went to graduation, I was tight that we had to take just the board exam, <laughs> let alone another clinical yeah. and the board exam. Yeah. Yeah. But so what was, um, what was it like for, for clinicals for you? What was your experience? So my first one, it was, it was honestly wild because, you know, I was expecting, all right, outpatient ortho, like I'm going to see outpatient ortho stuff. And I was seeing the craziest, craziest presentations on stuff. Like, even if on file, it's like, all right, like, uh, post rotator cuff, they're coming in saying like X, Y, and Z. And I'm looking at them like, wait, what? Like, I thought this was supposed to be a simple case or right, right. Like it, it opened your eyes to like, not everything's just going to be 
you know, straight up on the paper, what it looks like. It's not going to present always the same way. Uh, so really getting the experience was something that I needed and something I really liked. And my CI was pretty much like, you know, like whatever you want in this opportunity, you can have it. So like, I wasn't trying to say no to stuff. Even, even if I was like scared, I wouldn't say no, but I knew when I needed to say I needed help. I feel like there's a good distinction between that because you could be someone who, someone who feels like you're not ready for the opportunity. So you'll kind of sit back more or you could be someone who knows that you're not ready yet, but you still want to gain that experience. So either having the CI there to help you with it or being like, let me, let me start it at least. And like, you can chime in if I'm saying things wrong or like if my technique isn't right. So I like the fact that my CI was like from day one, pretty much she was like, whatever you want out of this opportunity, you can have it. So like, you know, things that'll be hard, I'll bring it to you. Things you want to learn, let me know. I'll teach you. So shout out to Tammy because she was dope. Oh, that is dope. And I think that brings like a important uh, piece of though that you're in an outpatient ortho doesn't mean you're not going to see like neuro type patients. They're like nothing lives in a bubble. Yeah. Like everything you have to still know different uh, realms of PT. No, I agree. Cause it's something where it's like, Oh, for me, like, I, I wouldn't say that I enjoyed my neural core or no, I'll take that back. I really did. And I, I enjoyed my neural classes, but I knew I didn't want to particularly treat those cases all the time. So me thinking like, all right, I'm going to go into outpatient ortho, I'm going to see extremity stuff, blah, blah, blah. But like, you need to know your neuro, even if you are treating those cases. Uh, and something that someone told me last year, uh, uh, which is, uh, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, but basically, I can't even remember his name right now. But basically what he told me was, even though you're interested in ortho, like if you don't know your neuroscience and your neuroanatomy, like you're not gonna be practicing at the best that you can. So that was something that stuck with me because I was trying to like push these courses to the side. And he was like, listen, like I am an ortho, you know, he's a manual therapist. Like he does mainly ortho stuff. And he was like, to learn all these before he was patient when he went through his uh, fellowship so i was like oh okay uh so that was definitely a big lesson to me i think a cool thing also is i like i saw a post is like every even every outpatient patient is a neuro patient because whether it's like they're not strong enough or they just don't have like the right motor control at some point you got to retrain their brain to understand what they're supposed to be doing so at the end of the day it really is neuro i remember this is not too long ago though but uh, second semester was our neuro semester and I did not like that one at all when we were going through it so I was just kind of going through the test just like pretty much at that point regurgitating as much as I needed to for that semester someone showed up no paperwork filled out for their initial eval and then I get the stuff all of a sudden as the patient's there and it says TBI and I was like oh shoot that was that entire semester I was like I have no clue what even like the best thing I came up was the clock drawing test I was like, dog, that was that. <laughs> I took nothing from that semester. And I had a bad thing to say. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, I, mean, I think one thing I will say, like, as like a shout out to like my neuro professors was that I think they understand that a lot of us don't necessarily want to like specialize in neuro, but they made the courses in a way that we could at least appreciate the aspects of neuro and what we should keep as important info and things that will continue on after we graduate and start to continue to practice so I like that aspect of it but kind of like you were saying like I got in the neuro class and I was like damn like I just want to get through this yeah. and you know <laughs> when it's done it's done but no, I definitely learned that I'm gonna have to keep a lot of that info for sure the funny thing was like I think uh that semester I got actually I got called out because we were we had like a boot camp so it was like a week long before the semester started of uh, just like neuroanatomy and I looked at all these slides the only words I knew on it was the and like spine and I, I kid you not I didn't know any other words on that page no nah, neuro is crazy I'm, I'm just glad I'm glad I just finished the, the last one this past fall so I'm kind of chilling so Tay, I want to um, get into some of the things that you do like extracurricular so me and Tao met well we both were on the nominating committee of the Student Assembly Board of Directors. Uh, what are some of the other organizations that you're um, a part of? 
Yeah, so at school, um, I helped with, so basically the founder of this org, let me shout her out first, uh, Afosa Rimse. <laughs> so she helped along with uh, a few of us on the e-board. We created this group called the Ithaca College Physical Therapy Students of Color. Uh, basically, we just try to connect current income students, uh, incoming students across, you know, different socioeconomic, ethnic, cultural backgrounds, and then just see how they could succeed in the program. Because our program is different, you know, starting as a, a, technically, you're like a first year PT as a freshman. I think that's a, a weird distinction, too, is that, like, you, so, like, technically, someone would consider me a sixth year PT at Ithaca, but if I'm talking to you, I'm a third year. Mm. So like they try to they try to implement early on like yes you're in the, you're a PT student like you're a PT student um, but to go through that when there's not that many people who look like you could be a challenge. So Fosta kind of knew that she wanted to have have an organization where she could help people and hopefully the students behind her wouldn't go through the same experiences that she went through. And so when she asked me if I wanted to you know help and be on the eboard, I was like of course. So we started that in 2019. Um, currently, I'm the president right now of that org. So it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of growth, a lot of opportunity to network, kind of like what Patrick was mentioning earlier, and then also just like opportunities to help others build. So and also just provide a safe space for people who kind of look like us. So that's the main thing that I'm really a part of, like at school. Uh, I'm trying to think. And then, like Patrick was saying, um, we were on NOMCOM last year. This year, I'm the chair. So, uh, unfortunately, not with the Dream Team no more, but I, I am with two other great people uh, and Sophia and Tyler. So, excited for another year of that. Um, and I think, I mean, those are like the, those are like the main things I'm involved in, but like, there's a lot of other service involvement that I'm in. I would say like the biggest thing for me is that especially once I got into like that professional phase of PT school, I knew like a lot of people had helped me to get to the point where I was then. So I knew I needed to help others kind of get to that same route or people who were on the same level as me, like, all right, let's do this together. So there's a lot of different projects that I'm in or service things I take part in just because like, to me, it's important to always just help others. So, you know, I like to compete, but at the same time, I'm like, yo, like, we're in this together so like if right. if i find some resource then like i'm gonna help you with the same opportunity well so um i i well i wasn't really on any of the boards or anything like that so i don't know if you two can kind of speak on what it was like being on the boards and being a, a pt student like in terms of i don't know just the time that you had to put in or like the things that you actually got out of it because i was just a regular regular student so i didn't get <laughs> i didn't do any of the, the extra <laughs> stuff yeah I say for for me, just uh, I I was getting burnt out just doing schoolwork. Like I hated just coming home studying, so and then like just doing the same thing over and over again. So like being involved in APTA and just other realms kind of gave yeah, it made my life a little bit more things to do. But putting more plates kind of helped me focus more. So it, it was nice um, switching things up. I like, hey, you know, you have to th get this school work done before you have to have this uh, meeting over here and then meeting at this time. So I was like, all right, it put like just like a fire to my ass to keep going. Yeah, kind of like what I liked kind of also like with like undergrad with uh, being on the football team was it like, gave me that structure kind of like Patrick was saying. So it kind of continued on as I got more you know less sport but then more opportunities for leadership and um service so but i will say this fall it was od hard i was doing too much i was doing way too much so like one of the one of the things that like i've been trying to work on is learning how to say no because you know as much as i do like to help people i kind of will say yes and then figure out how i'm going to help later on and i felt like this fall i I was doing entirely too much to where like my schedule was just like meetings, 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 teaching. Um, I was, I was either teaching or like a teaching assistant or tutoring or like a teaching assistant five days a week. Um, and then the service stuff. And then I was volunteering um, with the football team. So like, I didn't really have a lot of time to study 
which is why some of my girl, I was taking some else because <laughs> I, I had to make a choice. Like, yo, like I was doing so much. And then uh, also I think it was just hard because our faculty didn't realize that I was doing a lot because I don't really like to, I don't like to talk of always about like all this stuff I'm doing. I just like to help people and kind of just go to the side. Like I'm, I'm an introvert kind of like that. So not a lot of people realize how much I do unless like I'm actually telling you about it. Uh, so it was it was hard to, to do it this semester, but I would say the biggest thing that I did was, you know, rest, rest is key. So like I was always taking naps. Uh, I need to listen to music a lot. Uh, that helps me stay focused. Um, and then like support system, like, yo, if I didn't have my friends, especially this semester, it would have been a dub. Like they, <laughs> a lot of them knew I was stressed out. So they'd be like, all right, like, you know, you can come study with us at this time. Like, we'll go through what, what you need to know for this exam. Or like, uh, I know you're making study guides, but like I made this one complete. You know, you can use your notes to uh, match with mine and stuff like that. So the, the support system was very key. Yeah. And I think something cool as well as being involved with APTS, the conferences, and then like the amount of people that you meet at the conferences and the type of information, especially, I think my favorite was um, the student conclave, which they, they're no longer doing, but it was all, it was a conference meant for the students and all the courses and things mm -hmm. were like student focused. So what is it, what is it like to negotiate your salary? Mm -hmm. What's a different, what is travel PT? What does that entail? Uh, and kind of things of that nature and it's like it's not like CSM where I went to went to it as like a first year student and everything was over my head like I don't know what these guys are even talking about and then so creating getting uh, students together and then have you talk to each other you get to realize like all right I'm not the only one stressed out <laughs> going through this like people across the country are feeling the exact same way and then now you get to connect with different people doing different things. <laughs> oh, that's a fact. And conferences are just, it, it helps you realize why you're doing a lot of stuff as well. Work with, you know, not just students like you're saying, but like clinicians all across the country. Like you're making new friends all over the place and like people who are either going to be in the position that you want to be or people who are in that position that you, you want to be in. So like to have them like, front facing like and they're all pretty much chill to talk to which i think is like i wouldn't say it's more unique to P pt as a professional but i feel like we have so many open people that are just down to talk to you about pretty much anything but that kind of like reassures you of like why you got into it in the first place and like again like how you can build your network but then how you can help people afterwards like you can leave the conference and come back to school and be like yo this is what i learned or, like yo I, I heard you like this so, like I just met with this person, so let me tell you about this, or uh, kind of things along that realm. So that's that's really the reason why I like I really like to go to conferences. Yeah, and Tao, you have like a really you're really good at networking. So, um, because when I talk to you, um, I'm like, oh yeah, I like this. Well, I I know this person that does this, this, and this. Like, you should probably <laughs> reach out to them. Um, kind of like, how do you view networking, and how do you, um. So first question, how do you view networking and how do you build that up? I view, I view networking as like building relationships with people, right? Because at the end of the day, it's not, it's not about you just being like, yo, I know somebody. It's really like, how, how do they perceive you as well? Because it's like a two-way street thing. It's not you just hitting up somebody and then putting that to the side and be like, all right, bet, like I know this person. But you actually got to like build that relationship with the person, maintain that connection with them. Uh, so. I would say how I do it, it, it took a little bit, but I would say sort of what I do now is I'll reach out to you on whatever platform you're on. So it really don't matter to me. I'll hit you up on Facebook. I'll hit you up on Twitter. I'll hit you up on LinkedIn, hit you up on Instagram, email. Uh, and for me, it's more, it's more so trying to find somebody in a field I'm related in, but also uh, just networking in general. So I would say like an example is I'm interested in sports residencies, right? So when I was looking at programs, I would start searching, you know, uh, you know, insert name of the program, resident LinkedIn. 
and like you could pop up you know it'll show up people's names that have like done the residency or whatever and like you could look them up on linkedin try to connect with them or a lot of them are on twitter you can follow them i'll dm you yo i like what you're doing or you did this program like can we chat nine times out of ten they usually say yes especially as a student i feel like that's the biggest thing that people don't realize is that we we need to maximize opportunities that we have as a student because they're going to help you probably more as a student than they would as a clinician. As a clinician, they might be like, yeah, I'm going to help you, but like, here's, you know, slam me 10 bucks for an hour, or, you know, not even an hour, 15 minute consultation. And I'll, I'll, you know, we can go through some things. Whereas like, if you're a clinician, you want to help a student who's reaching out to you because they're like, damn, like, you know, a student thinks of me as like a role model, like think, is actually like trying to reach out to me to learn more about what I do. I feel like they're more inclined to give you sort of those tools of success. So usually I'll just, I'll just be, you know, researching people all over the place, find them, uh, reach out to them. And then we'll either, you know, chat via email, chat, you know, phone call, text, Zoom, whatever is possible. And then I try to maintain that relationship. You know, I'll, I'll try to reach out every once in a while through email, uh, through email or whatever uh, format we kind of created just, just to see how they're doing not necessarily along the lines of, you know, PT or stuff, but like, again, you know, they're people at the end of the day. So it's like, you want to know who they are outside of the field, as well as, you know, kind of what they do. And I feel like that's the cool part, because then you'll start to see a lot of similarities. I think one person in particular I really like is uh, Vien Vu. So shout out Vien. Uh, he's a guy who loves sneakers. I love sneakers. We connected like this because like, you know, you don't have to talk about PT. It's like, yo, like, did you pete those, you know, all fight? Uh, Nike that just came out yo you see those Jordans that came out you know stuff like that so like you don't have to you don't have to keep it at a PT level like these people are about to be you know your colleagues are about to be the same not same level as you but like you're about to be in the same profession so like being able to develop those relationships as a student to when you finally get to the point where you want to be those are the people who can vouch for you as your character beyond just you know a resume it's like, I actually know this person. I know what they're about. I know their character, you know, on top of that. Oh yeah, they do this, this, and this. So like, this is why you should hire them. I feel like that's, that's the way that you should try to develop your network because it's beyond, it's beyond just knowing or saying that you know someone it's now to a point where they know you just as much. And then they can vouch for you who you are as a person beyond just a clinician. I think that's very important. Like not only definitely a cheat code as a student because it's like most of as a student you're want to do so many different things and have no idea how to even get there and it's like well reach out to someone that that's done it that's that's the easiest thing and so um i it took me a while to get that point and then being able just to put yourself out there and just like dm someone and i was like hey look quick question i hey, saw so you did this and i would love to get your thoughts on it but i think it also on the next step as clinicians you can still take that next step like uh and build your network reach out um because there's especially being in california you we can't dry needle but i think you can uh, like patients still can see benefits so you can refer to a act uh, acupuncture and then you build that relationship and now you you can refer people to each other um even in different different things like that so definitely like a point that everyone can still um, benefit from no i agree and like the thing the thing for me too is like kind of like what you were saying is like you you have to understand that like it's not gonna be super easy the first time you try to reach out to someone like it might be awkward. I remember the first uh, first conference I went to was American Academy of Physical Therapy Conference in Chicago. And I was listening to Dr. Tim Vidal speak. And he, he like, if you don't know who he is, like you should look him up. This dude is different. Uh, but he he spoke, you know, kind of his experience. You know, he was in uh, pro baseball. He owns his own practice now. He has like three. He, he opened three practices or three clinics now. Um, has his MBA. Like all this stuff. I'm like, damn. So I was like, I need to go talk to him after. This is, this is my first time trying to like network. I go out there like, oh, hey, what's up? Like, <laughs> uh, like you know, I like I like what you do, kind of like, you know, I didn't I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew I needed to go speak to him and say something. And I think that's the important part is that like if you if you at least 
get the starting point, you can figure out all the other details later. I kind of, through a lot of like trial and error, have like a, a base template of like what I'm gonna try to say to someone. Because you wanna, while you are trying to reach out to these people and say whatever, you also wanna like minimize that entry point of like what you're saying. Cause no one really wants to read, you know, a two page email, but if it's like two, three sentences, kind of like what you're saying, like, Hey, I like what you're doing. Or like, you know, I'm interested in learning about X, Y, and Z. Like, can we chat? Starting to like minimize that, but also being more direct of like what you're expecting, at least from like that initial conversation will help you out in the long term. Cause you know, say in particular for me, like looking at sports, a lot of these people are doing stuff daily. So like, they're not going to be checking for someone who wrote a paragraph. You wrote like a couple of sentences, you know, they might not even, I think another thing too, is that like, don't be upset if they don't get to you right away. Somebody who I connected with, it took, I think two months for them to respond to my answer, but like, we're cool now. So like, it was like, <laughs> you know, they, they didn't see it at first, but it, it wasn't something that I was going to just keep hammering, hammering, hammering until they like got it. I, I put myself out there. I knew that like based off of who they were and how they represented themselves that they would probably get back to me. And like they did. And then we actually got into a conversation. So it's like, don't be, don't be afraid to fail. And then like, if it is something that they failed, like, and you don't make that connection, there's so many people across the country. Like you can, you can find someone else who's probably doing something similar. Yeah, I think taking it a step further, what have you done like networking with like any of your patients from clinical rotations? Like how has that been? Yeah, so like I think my my first rotation with my patients, it was it was pretty interesting. Actually, um I just went to go visit uh one of the patients I was with at their um local restaurant that they own over there. So uh being able to build rapport with those patients and then keeping those relationships afterward is something. And that's important too, in my opinion, especially as someone who's like early on in the process. So it was cool to kind of start in the beginning, trying to figure out like where you can help them with their problems. And then when you leave, being able to ensure that you like trying to get stuff and they were there, obviously. So I talked to them, said, Hey, you know, got to uh, get back into kind of like how they were doing and then updating them on my life. Uh, but them saying, okay, like, you know, I have X, Y, and Z, you know, I trust you, you know, what is your input on it? I'm like, yo, whoa, like I'm, <laughs> I'm still a student over here. But like, like the fact that like you, you're able to build that trust so much with the patient that they still want to like, you know, connect with you afterward is something that was pretty cool to me. So um, I would say in terms of like networking with like a patient, I don't know if I would say like it was like networking per se, but trying to like build that trust with them. A lot of the times in the clinic, I would just try to ask them about other things that they do outside of PT. Kind of like what I was saying with like networking with the person was like trying to get to know them more as a person beyond just, you know, that particular role. So one of the patients, you know, I, I got really close with because he liked the Yankees. So like we would always talk about the Yankees, the Yankees. You know, when I left, he always would email me like updates, like, damn, Yankees suck right now. Like, <laughs> yo, like, what are they doing? And I'm like, facts. But uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of times when you'll have similarities with people that you like, you wouldn't even know. And even if you don't have similarities, you can learn so much from other people about certain areas too, that you might then go on to enjoy. So I feel like that was, or those were things that I tried to do a lot with the patients was really just try to talk to them more outside of just, all right, like, you're going to do this two by 10 and like, let me know when you're done. And, you know, I'm going to do this manual for you. And then like, you're out the clinic. Like I really tried to talk with the patients as much as I could. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's pretty dope. And then cause I think it's important. Like you don't want to just talk about the treatment because at the end of the day, they're people too. With, and honestly, like if, if they felt, better they would rather not be there so just like making sure they realize that you see them as a person and just not something on on the list of people is important because at my facility we um it's kind of like 20 minute treatment blocks and so it's like i got 20 minutes to like talk to you uh see how you're progressing everything like that but also like 
to build that, continuing to build that trust to like, hey, I hear you. I understand what you're going through and trust me that once you tell me, like, tell me something like, all right, I will take that into consideration and then make something uh, like progress your treatment as necessary. And so it's, it's, it's all, it's a great point to like, you just have to be there and build trust. I think it was cool. Kind of what you're saying about the networking and kind of with your plan of care is I try to do that too, is like, try to get everybody's interests. So that way you don't get burnt out as a, as a PT. Cause if all I ever do is like three by 10 sit to stands, I'm like, that might not help you who might be a surfer here, or you might be playing basketball. So it's like, then you just make it more interesting. It's like, then you can pick up on those things. Like, all right, you like baseball. All right. We can make stuff similar to baseball because maybe you play in a slow pitch softball league after this. And it's like, Oh, cool. So now you can teach me some more things about baseball. So I'll do certain things like make sure certain things are on the TV when certain patients come in. Cause then it just sparks conversation. Cause a lot of times I'm like, damn, if I don't really find out like much depth to you, then I'm talking to you about this treatment or I'm trying to explain, <laughs> explain what I'm doing. I'm like, it's just kind of get, get, gets boring. So I feel like it's a cool way to just really um, like break up the session and then you can just make interventions more fun. So it's like, then it's like, all right, let's tailor it to more of what you like to do or the things that you have interest in. Yeah. You just gotta be a people person. If you're going into PT, like I credit that for me, um, working in retail beforehand. So I kind of had to get used to like the customer service aspect and like talking to people outside of just like trying to sell the, the product. And it's helped me a lot in terms of the transition to PT school and like dealing with patients and trying to like develop a therapeutic alliance. Cause there's a lot of people who are like mad smart, like, you know, 4-0 student, but, like they can't talk to nobody. So like, <laughs> yeah. that kind of, it's like, you know, they're just like, all right, like, this is your condition. I'm going to do this. And they're like, all right, bye. Like, they can't, you know, any other thing that sways one way or the other, like, it's over for them. They can't really uh, develop a conversation further with the patient. So, like, you, if you don't have any of those skills to, like, talk to people, you know, like, the, the soft skills they say or whatever, and, you know, obviously a lot of people have said, like, they're not really soft skills, but um, understanding those aspects with the patient, I feel like are the, the real things that are going to take you a long way because you might, especially as a new grad, you're not going to know everything coming out of school. But like, if you're somebody who can be, you know, approachable, someone who can be adaptable um, and you have those, those people skills, like the sky will be the limit for you and you can pretty much do what you need to do as long as you just work hard. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. Um, but I think it's, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, our our video camera decided to to boot us off. <laughs> Technology is wonderful, but I appreciate you, Teo, for <laughs> for taking the time and just talk to us of, about networking, your experiences, and just and I really appreciate you for being here. Yeah, no, thank you for having me on. Yeah, thank you, thank you both for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, we'll catch up next time. Take it easy. You have a good last last couple of clinicals. Final push. Almost there. You almost got it. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs>